Uh, hi everyone, my name is Leif Lindholm. Um, uh, I used to work for Linaro for many years and part of this material was created when I was still employed by Linaro, so I figured I owe them to put the logo up there. Uh, as of the start of this year, I now work for Nuvia, uh, which is a processor company. Um, I am also one of the stewards for the Tianacore project, which uh, is the umbrella project for the um, open source reference implementation of the UEFI specification. And I'm here to talk a little bit about um, open source UEFI and Tianacore and how we're go trying to help improve the interactions with um, community with regards to updating the specifications. And as a special thing we agreed last night, Art is going to pop in at the last few minutes to talk about some ideas he has about unifying the um, Linux kernel boot protocol on UEFI platforms. So I'll start with what we call the UEFI code first process. Um, code first is kind of a weird thing to be talking about at FOSTEM. I think everyone in this room knows what it is, just not that you needed to have a name for it. Um, what we mean in this context is maybe easier to explain by talking about how UEFI forum has worked on, on specification changes or additions up till this point. Um, and that requires some history. The UEFI forum was originally set up as a collaborative environment between, on the one side, a bunch of competing hardware manufacturers like AMD and Alarm, um, but also system and card vendors. Um, and on the other side, a bunch of competing firmware houses or BIOS vendors, as we still tend to call them. And peace was maintained in this situation um, by the UEFI forum bylaws, which as in many industry standards organizations, at least these days, um, focus quite strongly on protecting against submarine patents, making it into public specs. Um, and the ultimate guarantee of this protection is the process through which specification changes happen, um, which happens through effectively, well, Mantis or Bugzilla tickets being tracked in the background and, and called engineering change requests or ECRs. And these ECRs are discussed in NDA covered meetings um, as part of the specification publication process. Members are then given a deadline of speaking up or implicitly giving up any opportunity to claim infringement on any of their patents in the future. As a result of this, um, the, the guidelines has, have always been that before publica publication, um, code implementing new features cannot, under any circumstances, be published. And uh, as someone who was working on the 64-bit ARM side to try to get things out uh, aligned in time, this can be more than slightly frustrating. Um, so. The, the, the key point is that really only after the specification has been released is anyone actually protected from the, the patent nonsense. So, coming back to code first. Um, in short, it's a proposal for how we can organize the work of prototyping new features in public without violating the bylaws. Um, I recently sent out a proposal to the EDK2 RFC and EDK2 develop mailing lists. Um, the specific message is, is a link you can download from the presentation, which should be in the system already. Uh, and the short, short version of what this actually means is we will be tracking development of new features in the Tianocore Bugzilla, um, and we will have reference code um, and documentation of, of the new uh, features held under the Tianacore GitHub area. And then I think I forgot to put a slide in that points out that um, once we've done this, we've prototyped in the open, then it will turn into an ECR, which can be discussed by the forum and the bylaw 
bylaws are not violated. Okay, um, I think that went quite quick. Does anyone have any questions on that section before I move on to other random bits? Okay. So, I have a question. So, so the question is, how can you ensure that you're not violating any patents while you're prototyping the, the feature? Uh, and the simple answer to that is you can't, right? Because we've not gone through that process yet. So while you're prototyping it, we would you know, recommend that you don't put the prototype thing into your product. But it does mean we can do all of the development in public beforehand rather than doing something in the specification and then moving into the public. It's, that is certainly a theoretical possibility, but the intent is very much that that's not going to be the case. Uh, yeah, so I mean, as a, when we're putting the, um, whilst the things are, are in flight, we, we have a repository called EDK2 staging on that GitHub area, which is separate from the main um, EDK2 repository. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this isn't actually news as such, uh, as in I could have presented this last year, but I didn't give a talk last year. Um, so it's the first time it's been talked about at FOSTEM, I think. Um, so DUEFI self-certification test suite. Um, there are many test suites available to help verify the correctness of system firmware. You have the firmware test suite, you have the ARM server ACS, you have Chipsec, and, and probably a bunch of others that I couldn't be bothered to dig up for the list. Um, the UEFI SCT is a very basic one, but it verifies fundamental API conformance for UEFI implementations. Um, historically, that was not only secret, but like not properly version controlled really, and it was all a bit of a mess. Um, but as of October 2018, that is now open source on GitHub and people can contribute to it. Um, and yeah, I think I'm giving up on that. Um, one of the benefits of SET is that it is a test suite for all UEFI implementations. Um, so with the addition of the UEFI interfaces to, to U-Boot, um, it's, it's been really useful to be able to prove interface consistency between the implementations. And it, for me, it, it, even more important is that we're finally able to test the test suite against different implementations. Um, and as part of, of his work with U-Boot, Heinrich has already resolved some issues in the UEFI shell and in, inside SET itself which we could not trigger um, just against EDK2. Right, some completely random unrelated slides before I hand over to Ar uh, Ard. Um, risk 5 um, I actually missed the Risk 5 talk earlier today, but uh, the support for 64-bit uh, Risk 5 is going upstream in EDK2. A proof of concept port was initially submitted in 2016, um, but that was then kind of left alone until summer last year. Um, but now we've been going through and reworking it. I've been reviewing it and Abner Chang at HP been reworking it and upstreaming it and working also with OpenSBI to make that easier to plug into the EDK2 port. So you can track the current status on the RISC-V v2 port uh, at that link. If you click there now, you're going to find something very, very boring. But if you wait a few days, um, I'm, I'm going to have the latest stage of, of things up there. Uh, my personal goal is that we include risk 5 in the Q2 um, stable tag um, of, of EDK2. Um, licensing. 
always important at uh, FOSDEM. Um, EDK2 used to have a really tedious licensing situation um, with a separate Tianocore contribution agreement working in conjunction with the two-clause BSD. Uh, finally, uh, April last year, we uh, <laughs> relicensed all of this to a BSD two-clause with the explicit patent grant which gives exactly the same kind of protection um, as the Tianagorn Contribution Agreement did, but it wasn't home rolled. Um, at the same time, we, we took the opportunity to transition to using SPDX instead of regurgitating uh, whole licenses in, in every single source file. Um, and the open source platform tree, EDK2 platforms, also uh, followed suit uh, in a bit later last year. So that's, that's all up to scratch. Um, we support Python 3 and Python 2 these days, which may or may not be useful, depending on how many extensions you get. Um, we fixed the maintainer's text format, so it, we used to have a bit of a very non-granular way of who was maintaining which part of code. We've now moved to something that looks a lot more like what Q QEMU and Linux have and also developed some new um, scripts to help. So we have a get maintainer.py, um, and I also wrote a setup git.py to make some, some common known good settings for sending things to Tianocore um, work right. And, no, no, I think, I think it's time for art. Oh yeah, I have stickers. <laughs> Come grab some. Just hold it like this. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Art Bietzhevel. I work for ARM, and I uh, manage the Linux EFI subsystem. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I maintain the EFI uh, subsystem in Linux, and uh, well, my background is ARM. I was formerly at Lenaro as well. Um, and only lately, like the past month or so, I have the, have the pleasure of looking at the x86 code we have in the EFI stub uh, to boot, uh, well, find init RDs and find command line, find parameters, etc. And so what I'm looking into now, especially because we want to have uh, secure boot stuff going upstream in Grub and other places, is to see if we can uh, unify that, get rid of all the well, bespoke pieces for different architectures that live in the various bootloaders. So what I... Ah, yes, sorry. Ah, okay. Okay, that's an interesting, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so what I'm proposing, what I'm uh, prototyping and what I'll send out to the list soon is a way of uh, booting uh, the Linux kernel in EFI mode, uh, completely generically. Louder. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, what I will be proposing and sending to the list soon is a way to boot the Linux kernel from Grub or from Uboot or for whatever EFI capable uh, uh, system firmware, uh, completely generically. So, there will be no DT handling to put in initRD addresses or no boot param struct that gets populated, etc. It's all simple. Uh, EFI protocols and interfaces uh, that should permit like the next uh, architecture that gets Grub support uh, or the next architecture that gets added to you or whatever to just use complete generic interfaces uh, and hopefully move over the existing architectures. Well, we discussed later yesterday it may take five years or it may take 20 years, but at least we have something to move towards to uh, to make it completely generic. Any questions about that? All right, Art. Does that, does that require new specification changes? Uh, no, no, no. It doesn't look like it does. You mentioned a CP running against Tiano Core uh, and running against Ubuntu implementation. 
but have you run a CT against some closed binary, close, closed UFI implementations? Have I personally? No, but they all do it themselves, so. Uh, sorry. I was expecting Martin to be loud enough to be heard from over there. Uh, the question was whether I had tested SCT on any closed source um, BIOS implementations. Um, I personally haven't. Um, I know other people have, and I know that all of the BIOS vendors, they, they kind of have to do it. Okay. Thank you.